Today, we're diving into a powerful story of resilience and self-discovery. Jared Walker grew up in a world consumed by fear. An eight-year-old child convinced that the end of the days were right around the corner. Raised in the worldwide Church of God, a white supremacist doomsday cult, Walker's childhood was dominated by apocalyptic prophecies and disturbing doctrines. Yet despite his church's racial prejudices, Walker's Black family believed they were chosen for salvation. But when the promised doomsday didn't arrive in 1972, his family, like many others, faced a reckoning. How do you rebuild a life when your beliefs have been shattered? Today, we'll explore Walker's journey from a childhood defined by control and fear to finding his own path free from the shadows of fantasism. This story forces us to reflect on how institutions can manipulate the vulnerable and how reclaiming one's autonomy requires immense courage. Stay tuned as we unpack Gerald Walker's transformation from a child trapped in a cult to a writer who reclaimed his life. This story is from The Guardian by Steve Rose, published on September 10th, 2024. So AJ, I'm coming to you. What role does fear play in maintaining control within doomsday cults? And why do some individuals remain loyal even after predictions fail? I think that it always comes down to childhood, to how you're raised. If you see in, in many of these very extreme religious cults or, or even uh, Christianity, Catholicism, you find that kids are raised to believe things are the same level of factualness, right? You, you teach kids something like, we need water to survive, or Jesus performed miracles, or you're going to go to hell if you don't do X, Y, Z. And all of these things become exactly the same. They become just as true as the other. So you grow up believing all these things. You grow up believing that your soul is going to go to hell if you don't do as you are told. And generally, this is being taught by people in a position of high authority, you know, leaders of the church, even parents. Unfortunately, parents don't really have that choice of, of becoming that because they grew up exactly the same way. And I think this is how people go from childhood to adulthood, thinking that they have to stay within these structures, within these cults, no matter how harmful they become. I was thinking about how psychological factors can also make one susceptible to this. Um, did you want to possibly touch on that, Scott? Like, what factors make people susceptible to joining or staying in harmful organizations that AJ just alluded to, like the Worldwide Church of God, despite clear, like crystal clear contradiction? Right. Um, well, I mean, we're we're a social, social species, right? And so we're influenced a lot by our society, by our, our people that we see as peers, people that we want to be like, that we want to be around, that we w rely on to help us, that they rely on us. That gives us a sense of purpose and a sense of belonging. And so being part of a group is just a massively uh, huge influence on, on an individual of any age. Um, but as AJ pointed out, uh, children have the additional, um, I, I shouldn't really call it a drawback because we evolved to, to develop this way, but children really just believe whatever their parents say. You know, they, they start out, they'll believe whatever they say, they'll do whatever you tell them to do, and they'll stick with it. And and so that, uh, at, at, at that early age, uh, I think it was Aristotle that said, you know, that famous quote, give me a man by age seven, or no, give me a child b before age seven, and I'll give you the man. Meaning that if you can, if you can implant, implant, if you can uh, encourage particular beliefs uh, uh, at that young age, then they will last throughout their lifetime. But even once we, you know, we see adults joining these groups and staying in these groups and you know why can't they just decide to leave the group after
after the fact? Well, because there's lots of social support in those groups. There's lots of uh, uh, it's frowned upon to question the uh, the beliefs of the organization to, and especially to question the, um, you know, the leaders of, of those organizations. In the in the previous section segment that we talked about this week, we brought up the idea of authoritarianism. And so that that's, you know, very much central to the to many religions. You know, many religions have a God at the at the at the head and who dictates what what should be done and what you should not be doing and that kind of thing. And so um, from the very beginning, from day one, from page one, even it's a it's a very uh, authoritarian approach. And so and once somebody gets in with a group like that, it's very tough to shake those feelings because you feel like you're rejecting your identity. You feel like you're rejecting your friends and family. And so, you know, we have very uh, evolved, strong emotions that try to keep us tied to that group even at the expense of our own well-being and and truth, to be honest. And so um, so psychology definitely has a, a major uh, impact on that. And it, that's what makes it so that's why that this kind of phenomena is so persistent is because it's our nature to kind of go along with it and, and to and to stay with it. You know, we've seen so many of these, uh, you know, these end of the world groups prof- professing to to know when the world ran. And obviously they've been wrong so far every Every time, every time you would think it would sink in and it's not. So there's got to be something happening behind the scenes. And I think it's that, you know, our, um, you know, our evolved psychology, which happens to have a side effect of, you know, promoting this type of uh, blind belief. And, and uh, it can be frustrating, but it's human nature and it's probably not going to change anytime soon. You know, Scott, you brought up something that I kind of wanted to touch on because of the structure of this particular church, uh, worldwide church being not only a do- doomsday cult, but a white supremacist doomsday cult. And <clears throat> you can even imagine uh, Gerald Walker's family being part of this uh, organization, being a Black family in the 60s, 70s, in the 60s and the 70s. Um, listening to their rhetoric, being who they are, because you can't change your race, and still having to believe or being taught that they have to believe the things that's being talked to them over the pulpit. Um, I kind of want you both to kind of, you know, glance on this because I believe both of you all brought it up in your own research. But AJ, I'm coming to you first. Um, How can the intersection of race and religion complicates one's identity, especially in environments where white supremacy is normalized? You know, I think a lot of these doomsday cults and, and other extremely uh, nationalistic type of Christianity where, where it was very extreme, they use a type of uh, philosophy that makes makes it where the rules have to be exactly this and then you have to follow these rules. Uh, to, so to me, like the most surprising aspect of this specific story of Walker was the cognitive dissonance that was necessary to justify participating in a group that actively segregated its members, right? Walker mentioned that Black members had their own separate church and they were not allowed inside the white church. And it made me wonder whether the rules were even the same, uh, given that, you know, even heavenly rules were different. For example, the church founder made made it very clear by preaching that white people were made in the image of God and black people were put on earth to be white people's servants and that heaven would also be segregated. So even though black people were going to be saved and were allowed in the church, it would not be with white people. So Walker stated that uh, the church founder, Armstrong, used a scripture from the Bible to excuse that racism, which actually helped uh, the Black members accept the idea that they were inferior to white people because it came straight from the Bible. And and as as I mentioned earlier, these are words that you are meant to take literally and and strictly, and these these are the rules. So, and this unfortunately is far too similar to like the horrific practices 
uh, of slave Bibles that were used to indoctrinate slaves, right? To keep them obedient to their white masters and preserve the system of oppression of African slaves. And they, I feel like they were using a, a very similar concept here. That's what I, I thought of as soon as I read that part is like, this is the same type of um, techniques that were used in uh, the antebellum South during slavery. Um, the slave Bible specifically omitted passages that alluded to anything that had to do with freedom, um, emancipation, um, uh, being able to even, you know, see yourselves as like your counterpart, because I believe that uh, passage, I want to say, I- I'm not sure if it's in Ephesians or if it's, if, I know it's like one of Paul's books where it says there's neither uh, male nor female, Greek nor uh, Greek nor Jew, bond nor free. We are all one in Jesus Christ. So that would be a passage that would have been completely taken out. Matter of fact, I believe that the majority of Exodus in the slave Bible was completely omitted because Uh, that is a story specifically talking about, right, about how God, um, freed uh the uh the children of israel because he was their chosen people and they were bonded to too long in egypt um so it it's it's interesting how a lot of times and i and i think about this and you guys just forgive me i just i gotta i gotta get this out for a moment <laughs> all right vent vent <laughs> right, just go yeah, for it <laughs> yeah yeah this is kind of in the thing that i talk about a lot but it's interesting how one can use the bible specifically just by charity picking certain ports in order to fit a narrative that you're trying to basically propagate, right? So this this whole notion of white people are uh, superior to black people, that this is the reason why we have to keep you separated, have you regulated to certain positions in the church. You cannot be a church leader or you can only be an underling so far because you are black, you are not white. And God has a specific area that white people are supposed to occupy and a specific area that black people are supposed to occupy. And that is to be white people's servants. It's the Mm -hmm. same thing that was also um, written in Mein Kampf by Mm -hmm. Hitler. He said the exact same thing. He, even though that he is said basically very anti-Semitic things against Jews, Jewish people. But when he got to other groups of people, especially black people, he said, well, you're not evil per se, but you ain't that smart <laughs> neither. So the only thing that you really can do is just be servants to the Aryans, i.e. Mm. white people, the perfect white people, right? right so right, it's right. it's it's interesting like how I, I keep saying interesting because like, you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to be objective. I'm trying to be objective here, guys. But it's it's uh yeah. I should actually say it's dumbfounding that yeah. the this particular rhetoric exists and how it has been recycled in generation after generation. And how effective proper- it is. And and how and yeah. how superbly effective it is in order right. to actually keep a certain group of people subjugated. But I'm sorry, uh, Scott, I was taken away from my question that I was asking you because I know you alluded to that particular that same thing as well in your research. So please talk. Well I mean it's it's <laughs> going back to the to the racial issue, right? If I remember correctly from the article the this particular group uh, preached that black people were lower than than white people but then they also said that the black people that participated in their group were a notch above uh, black people that were not part of the group and so I think perhaps what we can see here I'm not an, I'm not an expert on this and I'm certainly not um, um, all that knowledgeable on what it's like to be uh, a black person going to church um, but we'll we, talk we, after this yeah okay Okay, all right. You give me the give me the inside scoop on that. Sure. <laughs> But uh, but we see this kind of thing with like conspiracy theories and and conspiracy theorists, psychologists say that uh, they're attracted to these kind of things because they feel like they're special, like they they're in on some kind of special information. They know something that the rest of the population will know. Or in this case, um, they're they're part of a group that's going to survive, at, you know, when humanity gets wiped out and that kind of thing. Or they're going to be sitting at the at the head of the table or at least, uh, you know 
know, maybe serving the head of the table, but at least being part of that process. And so um, it's it, it's hard to imagine that that kind of uh, impetus would be powerful enough to to encourage a family that were, were stuck in a situation where they were being looked down upon. They would, and they would look forward to it. They would, they would lap it up and say, please, can I have some more? And it, it was just very, uh, it's very, it was very frustrating to read for one thing. It was very, uh, I could feel my chest tightening and I could feel my stomach getting all riled up. And it, it was just a, um, a very unfortunate situation, but I think we see it quite a bit. And, um, and, and it's not just uh, racial issues too. You, you wonder why a black family would be part of this church group but at the same hand we can we can wonder why women flock to christian churches i mean women are not uh you know they don't have a uh an exalted spot in the bible and uh you know or or lgbtq people right why why do they continue to support their christian um you know their pope even their pope who who says that you know you can't be gay if you want to if you want to get into heaven and so it's from that from the outside we might boggle our minds and think how could somebody fall for this shtick right but you know it's been it's it's got there's got to be some part of human uh the human condition that uh, urges us to go in that way and i think the the being part of the special group being in on the uh on that uh this secret knowledge and that kind of thing being part of the in group uh can be very very powerful motivator and and clearly uh it happens here uh the second thing i would bring up though is that uh just religion in general i think is very powerful we you know we talk endlessly about how uh people are taught not to to question their religious beliefs. So, so slaves in in the antebellum south of the United States were um, were were taught that this was the way it was supposed to be by your your slaves obey your masters, even the cruel ones. And and so uh, it literally says that word for word in the Bible. And so 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 they're taught to it. It's a side effect of or maybe even a feature, not a bug, but of just religion, religious thinking in general. We, we talk about where's the harm. This is a, a big piece of the harm right there is that if you if you buy in, if you take that first step into irrational belief, um, even even if you are in the quote unquote friendly religion or liberal you know Christian or, or, or that kind of thing, just taking that step across that threshold makes everybody on that side of the threshold stronger. And so um, by by moving in that direction, you're more likely to fall for these kinds of statements for, for these uh, proclamations that different people are on different tiers in society. And you know if you want to question that, you'd be questioning your identity, you'd be questioning the entire group. And so it's there's just, it, it, if you think about it from that perspective, it's amazing that not more people are caught up in it. And, and uh, you know, it, it seems like it's just an overwhelming force and, and it's, it's very frustrating. So I, I think that makes it all the more important that there's people like us that want to talk about it. Two well, billion what, is quite a bit of people. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it's it's two billion, it, yeah. yeah, exactly. Definitely. Like, you know, it's in Christianity, like the biggest religion in the entire world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I know that we were talking about like, you know, the whole thing about people being stuck in this belief system. Them, right. But, you know, uh, uh, one of the reasons why we are talking about this story specifically is that Walt Walker found himself out. Right. So, um, AJ, I'm going to come to you first. Um, reading the article, if you can just think about why do you uh, believe that maybe some individuals like Walker succeed in escaping the cycle of indoctrination, self-destruction, while others like his brother did not? You know, I think... Um... It has a lot to do with with also how you are how you are raised, right? Like all of your your environment and your upbringing. You may even be raised in the same house, but your experiences, the way that you're perceiving them, are going to be a little bit different. And I think a lot of people who actually go into religion are taught not to question, as we mentioned earlier, and mm-hmm. not to not to put too much thought on what these rules are telling them right so there is a lot of focus on this eternal life and they are making so many sacrifices on this earth to achieve that goal and part of that is attempting to um i'm sorry i totally lost my train of thought oh no worries (laughs) it's all good (laughs) we'll just just cut that off and and, yeah (laughs) that's not a problem it's all good i was like did i even answer the question (laughs) yeah no 
Okay, I'll, I'll start right there. Yeah. Uh, so I think the reason that some people are unable to come out of that uh, is because they just completely refuse to use that method of critical thinking, right? Mm. And there are people who are who are actually exposed to to new ideas. Um, one of the the things that I always find most fascinating is that people who start reading or or who go to college are some of the ones who are more likely to deconvert from religion. And as you mentioned, Walker, he he became a writer, and I believe that that was uh you know that being his passion he more than likely was somebody that that began reading a whole lot and i mm-hmm. think that, that that information uh sort of was the difference that that it made between him and his brother you know the, the access to knowledge i guess to us the access to information yeah maybe access to information is very important um i really believe that when people are able to get different thoughts from what has been put to them previously right and different ideas and and just a difference of even opinion can definitely interrupt some part aspects of indoctrination right. and and one of the things that you know we are a part of is the atheist community of Austin and and one of the things that is the I believe the most important portion of that name is community. And I'm wondering, what is our responsibility? I I want both of you all to just, you know, just kind of give like a a minute response to this, if you can. Mm -hmm. What is the responsibility of communities like us to have supporting people who are leaving harmful religions and and helping them integrate back into normalcy in society. Uh, AJ, I want you to go first, and then Scott, you round us up. All right. Uh, well, I, I want to go in, into something for a second that, that I thought something that was really important in this um, in this specific case. Right, as a disabled person myself, being legally blind and deaf, I couldn't help but sympathize with his parents. You know, both of his parents had lost their vision due to some uh, traumatic accidents in childhood. And I can recognize that religion and cults often prey on and take advantage of vulnerable people who are going through experiences that are very traumatic like that. Um, So... Walker said that his parents were promised that their bodies will be whole and that they will regain vision when Christ, Christ returned. And he believed, and I agree, that his parents' blindness played a key role in why they were so willing to participate in this court that was, you know, in turn extremely harmful to his whole family. So to answer, to, to go back to your question, I think that this is something that, that we as the secular community can do more for to help people who are more vulnerable, right? Like, like in, the, in their case, they were blind people and both of their parents were blind. And I think that the community as a whole could have done so much more to give them the support that they truly needed to succeed so that they didn't turn to such a controlling environment that eventually, you know, took advantage of them and took their money and took their happiness and took, you know, uh, Walker's life basically was, was completely entangled in that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's very important, and we and we also need to take into consideration. Um, speaking of the responsibilities of communities like ours, um, we talked about information already. So first of all, providing information, uh, it's 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 important that people, like both of you were saying, that people hear a variety of perspectives, that hear a variety of opinions, that hear a variety of approaches to thinking, uh, and and so that in in itself can give an individual can empower them to make changes in their own life can it can empower them to think about things in a slightly different way um to quote unquote rely on their worldly thing you know their worldly reasoning and that kind of stuff um but i think it's also important that communities like ours um and aj was was talking about this uh, do provide support i mean the, the it it can be traumatic to leave a situation like that to leave a situation where your family is supported where you're where you feel loved where you feel have friendships where you identify with the group and and these these small cult groups are i mean they could be very tight and and so their their identity is very closely tied into that group and so when you leave 
leave that group, you're leaving everybody you know, and you're leaving everything you ever had, and you're leaving everything you've ever known. And so being able to not only have information that there are uh, communities like that are different out there, but also then when the rubber meets the road, is the support going to be there? Uh, are, are there going to be people that can pick up the slack as far as this, the social, the loving requirement, the friendship requirement, maybe even uh, helping each other uh, with, you know, financial issues or finding a job or, or finding a new place to live and, you know, things like that. And so I, 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 I think, uh, you know, the combination of information and support after the fact, I think that can be, um, that can be very helpful. And, and uh, you know, w- religious groups aren't going to provide that. And so it, it's up to us to get that stuff done. It's up to us. Yep. Well, Walker's experience highlights the dangers of dogma and the ways in which it can warp familial bonds and personal potential. Despite the indoctrination that led him to feel chosen yet inferior, he ultimately broke free of those constraints. His story is a reminder of the importance of questioning narratives imposed on us, seeking our truths and the transformational power of education and mentorship. And I just have a personal side. Boy, what could Gerald Walker's life been have been may have been like if him and his family were familiar with black non-believers? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But I'll tell you something, viewer. If you want to be more familiar with the nonprofits and more things that we talk about, click here.